Hello again, everyone. I'm Ariel Hawani. Hope you're doing well. You know, as you probably know, I love all things mixed martial arts. I'm also fascinated by facial hair. And so I am very excited today to speak to the man who you see on the camera alongside me because I've wanted to talk to him for quite some time. He is one of the best officials in the sport of mixed martial arts. He also probably has the most famous facial hair in the sport of mixed martial arts. He's the great Mike Beltran, and he's kind enough to join us today. Mike, how are you? Hey, how you doing, Ariel? How are you? I'm doing great. It's uh, it's really great to talk to you. I really appreciate this because uh, I've long been an admirer of yours, not only because you're one of the better officials in this game, but because of your amazing facial hair. So uh, let's start there, if you don't mind, because uh, it is infamous. I mean, everyone knows about your your mustache. And and I want to be clear, it's a mustache, not a beard, right? You consider it a mustache. Yeah, yeah this, this, is, this, is, this is clarified before we go any further, okay? Yes, it is a mustache. So it is not a beard. It is a mustache or... I call it a mustache, you know, so it's, it's a beard is something that grows down the middle and everything else. This is, there is nothing in the middle. It's a mustache. So started out, you know, it started out as a mustache and it took an identity of its own. Call it what you will. I call it a mustache. Now, do you shave this part here? Yeah. I shave down the middle for sure. Okay. Now why, why, wow, that is fascinating. That is amazing. That just blew my mind what you just did. Okay. So let's start at the beginning. When did you start growing this? <sighs> Jeez. I've had a, uh, it's been it's been going for about at least 13 years 13 no a little over 13 years now okay and why did yeah. you start growing it you know what i hate shaving i just hate shaving you know i've i've, I've always been clean cut before that and and um it's just something that uh i just liked the way it looked and it's it, you know there was no real reason why i just did it just, i just hated shaving and uh um i just grew it out and uh unfortunately it's you know i got the facial hair that, that just grows. It doesn't grow on my head. I wish I was blessed with that, that gene and I wasn't. So, you know, it uh, fell off my head and onto my face, my back and chest. And here I am now with a full beard. So, you know, that's, that's just kind of how it is. And um, for the most part, honestly, Errol, it's, it's something that it's just, it's just me, you know, um, it's something to who I am. And, and um, it, it's just something that I didn't plan for it. You know, honestly, just something that just grew and here it is, you know, and it took off and, you know, I was uh, officiating, and uh, um, I never really looked at it being anything different. I was just doing my job and being myself. And, um, and here we are today talking about a mustache, you know? So, it's amazing. This is what, that's what's up. But here's the thing. A lot of people hate shaving. I hate shaving, but I don't have something like that, right? I mean, I don't have something as extensive as you. So why go from I hate shaving, which is you know very respectable, and I feel the same way, to letting – the beard grow that long or the mustache, excuse me. Um, you know what? There's no real reason. I, I honestly, I've, when it was growing out, um, it was, you know, it was just kind of taking different looks on it. And, and I, I just remember, uh, I said, man, you know what? It looks cool like this. And I want to see how, how it would look if it would be a little longer. And then from there, it's just like, okay. And I started trimming it here and there. And, and, and before you know it, it's like, here it is, you know, it's peppy lung stocking upside down, you know, and it's, 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 it's just, it just grew an identity of its own. And, uh, it's no real rhyme or reason other than, uh, I, it just throughout the years is something that, you know, would trim it up, but I just, it just for one reason or another, I just didn't like the way it looked and it just kind of grew, you know? And, um, when I worked out or, or get on the mat and train, I just tuck it in my rash guard and, and I just roll that way. So, you know, obviously when training with the training partner, you know, a bro wouldn't be a bro if he wouldn't go reach for your stash or your facial hair and start pulling on it and, and start, you know, trying to go for a, for a gi choke with it. And, uh, um, you know, so we've had some fun with it throughout the year. So, yeah, that's, that's really no, no, uh, just something I just decided to do, just grow. Do you, do you still trim it till this day or have you not done that in a while? You know what, my, my fiance's, uh, my fiance's trimmed about a foot off already throughout you know she's taken off about a foot or a little about a foot and a half now in maybe nine years so okay she's, yeah she's taking some time actually yeah nine years she's taking about a foot and a half off of a foot for sure and as far as the look itself where did that come from like to to shave in the middle and, and to make it into more of a mustache as opposed to a long beard <laughs> how did that come about really there's like i said it just like a beard I didn't want a beard. My, it started off as a mustache. 
like it just totally started off as a mustache. And, and, and when I had it, even, you know, growing up, I always had a, a mustache and it was always kind of like a, you know, Hey man, I'm from East LA, bro. All right. Yeah. So every Vato in East LA has a mustache, you know, there's a big difference between a regular stash and a mustache from East LA and East LA dudes have, you know, the big brochas and the cum brochas in, 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 in East LA. It was a big mustache. And, and, uh, um, that's what started off. It looked like a caterpillar rolling on your, on your, on your lip, you know? And, uh, and then from there, it just, boom, here it is today, you know? And that's it. It's, there's really and, no, and, no, no real and, thing to it, you know? In terms of maintaining it and taking care of it, what's the process there? I'm fascinated by this. You know what? Um, I'm kind of a clean freak. So I, I do, you know, i I condition about twice a week and, uh, and I do shampoo and I keep it very clean. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm very clean. So, um, you know, I, mean, I look like a dirty biker, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, definitely look like I may have hygiene issues by my appearance, believe it or not. And, uh, but, uh, no, I'm, I'm actually very clean and I keep that in order for the most part, you know, um, I condition it. I use my lady's hair products. So whatever she uses works for, works for her. So I figure if it works for her, it'll work for me. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I use. It's funny. You, you make the joke about a biker. Are, are, are you a biker? Like, do you, do you ride a bike? I feel like if you have a mustache like that, you almost have to ride a bike. You know what, dude, that's, that's funny. You say that, bro, because, um, I don't have a bike. I don't have a bike. And, and, um, you know, that's, that to me was, was, is something I do want to get now, now that my son's out of high school and, and he's, he's, uh, you know, he's off to school, but, um, you know, I couldn't afford a bike at the time because I put my kids through a private school. So almost like, I, you know, I think we, we talked before and I'm a single father who, who uh, had full custody of my son. So my priority was raising my boy. Um, look, dude, I still drive a 2003 truck. You know, I don't have, I mean, just because we referee on TV or what we've seen on TV, we don't make a whole lot of money. So to give you an honest answer, do I want to get a bike? Yes. But my priorities were raising my boy and putting him through a private school and giving him the best education possible. Uh, my son was a national level wrestler out of St. John Bosco High School. So uh, private schools aren't free. So all the money that I made in officiating, everything that I'd done on the side, all the hustle I pulled was, was went to my boy. And, you know, um, with my foot in his butt and, and blessed by God, my son's at West Point. So, you know, so we, we had a plan, tutoring, everything else. So I would rather see my son at West Point and have an opportunity to succeed in life than being a selfish single parent that thinks about himself and get a bike or nice cars or fancy stuff than having my priorities out of whack. So, you know, that's something sensitive for me. But do I wish I had a bike? hundred percent. But I will eventually, you know, now that he's, he's on his way and everything else, um, I'll get myself a bike down the road. West Point, obviously in New York State. How is he doing? Is he is he still there? No, he's actually here. Um, classes were suspended, um, obviously nationwide. So um, he's at home here, and he's doing his classes like online, where the teacher is doing you know virtual classes. So uh, the classes in West Point are very, from what I understand, what Mikey says is like maybe ten kids per class. So they get one on one instruction. Like it's it's it's. It's academically challenging and his classes are, are online with the with his teachers that's how they're they're facilitating this situation but when will he will when he'll be going back is i don't know um hmm. you know we don't know especially in new york obviously you're you're back east so the situation over there is pretty pretty grim so until things lighten up god willing this too shall pass and, and uh, uh things will get back to somewhat normalcy you know Let's start at the beginning of, of your MMA journey. When were you first introduced to the sport? You know what? I was introduced to the sport in 2002, right? Obviously, we all were there from the beginning of the, uh, the infancy stage of, of, of MMA. With, back then, it was called NHB. It was uh, No Holds Barred, and then it turned into MMA. Um, I began formally training in 2002. But I was a fan of the sport when it first came out. Um, I was just completely blown away by Hoist Gracie and what he did. Um, how this, you know, skinny man uh, in a in a in a wearing pajamas, which which is a gi, 
and he's choking fools out and, and doing magical stuff. I thought it was mind blowing. I was like, wow, that, that, that guy he's competing is a big beast. He's a monster. There's no way this guy has a chance. Um, so I began, I began training with a really good friend of mine who passed away. He's uh, Joe Camacho. Uh, he was a fighter. And he was my best, one of my best friends in high school. He fought, um, got me in the sport. I began training and, uh, interesting when I went to the gym, which is new breed Academy in Santa Fe Springs. That's the gym I train at. Um, I went to the school and I saw people rolling around and I used to box when I was younger. So I never wrestled. I don't have a wrestling background until I got into to training. So rolling around to me was like, I don't want no dude on me. Get away. It's like, that's not my thing. This is back, in, you know, the, the, the beginning years. Um, I went on the mat and I remember I got my butt handed to me by everybody, everybody there kicked my butt. And I was a bigger guy than I was like 250 pounds. I got rolled up by everybody. I got busted down Ariel to rolling around with a seventh grader who was on me. And he was like, the only thing that kept me from getting submitted or getting my butt kicked was I had man strength over the seventh, seventh grade kid. And after that, I had two choices, either tuck my tail between my legs and walk away and wish this nightmare never happened. And hopefully nobody will ever talk about it or embrace it and come back to it and learn. And that was my journey in 2002. And I came back to that school and, and I've been training ever since. And that began my MMA journey, training with fighters and training with uh, jujitsu practitioners. And I fell in love with the sport, which you and I, we both have a passion for it in different capacities. And uh, I've been training ever since. And that's my story. That's how I began. Did you ever fight professionally no. or amateur? You never took a fight? No, I don't. No, no. I, I, never, I never fought professionally or. Or amateur. Yeah, you were breaking up. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. You, did you ever fight professionally or amateur? No, no, I never did. No, I never did. I just trained and, and uh, uh, just rolled and. So to say anything like that would be, be a lie. I never did any fighting at all. So how, how do you go from that to then becoming an MMA official? What's the connection? The connection there was John Iwano was one of my instructors. He was the one who made the first gloves for the UFC back in the day. And it was the Iwano glove. And that's what they used. He knew a guy who was a referee and was very good friends with just so happened to be big John McCarthy. Um, he said, he's a good friend of his. And I said, you know what? I, I used to go to the fights and I would see some of the referees and I got told myself, you know what? I can see myself doing that. And he goes, I think you could, I think you'd do a good job, Mike. Why don't you, why don't you give it a shot? Let me call my friend. And the rest is history. I met big John and the real reason why I'm, I'm here today and talking to you and done other interviews and, have been a part of this journey is, is, is because of big John McCarthy. He is the real reason why I'm here. Um, he has taken me under his wing. He has schooled me. Um, he's yelled at me a lot. He's yelled at a lot of us a lot. Um, but he's passionate about the sport just like I am. So when we talk about this sport that we have a passion for and we want what's best for the sport, Sometimes we're going to have tempers are going to flare and we're going to want to do what's right for the fighters, for the sport, what's better for the sport. But at the end of the day, Ariel, what's important is this is a privilege. This is a privilege as a referee. This is a privilege as an official. It's a privilege for you as, as, as a journalist, what you're doing, to be a part of this journey. And we can't lose sight of that, man. We have to be take it in, especially as a referee. I could be here one day not, and not the next. You know, and so long as I still have that passion and that drive and, you know, the, the common sense and the judgment to make the right calls and do what's best for the sport and for the fighters, I'm going to stay relevant in the sport. Once you start going in a different direction, we got problems. So my journey began a lot with big John McCarthy, who schooled me. And since then, it's been a great ride. I've met a lot of awesome folks and great referees that, that we're all close with and judges and uh we still train today even right now during this quarantine time and and uh this this pandemic andy foster um uh, athletic commissioner for california 
we've been having training every Thursday. Hmm. Every Thursday, we've been having training with referees and judges, primarily with judges. A lot of referees are on there, up to 60 people on a Zoom call like this, judging, judging fights, talking about criteria and how to better the sport. A lot of stuff goes on behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know uh, when it comes down to the officials trying to make the sport better. These, these are judges that they are high-level judges. You got Sal D'Amato. You got Derek uh, Cleary, um, Mike Bell, Ron McCarthy, Chris Lee, um, Chris Colon. These are the these are the top judges, and they all train. Believe it or not, the sport and are involved in it. And we're all talking together about the sport collectively on these on these conference calls and trying to watch fights, critique it, how we could have done things better. Big John's on it, and a lot of commissioners are on it nationwide. So. You know, that's what's going on behind closed doors during this time. Wow, that is fascinating to me. Now, is that a thing that you guys are doing just during this time, or has that been a thing even before this? You know what? It's right now is because obviously the states aren't working and there's not shows going on, you know. So um, Andy Foster took this, I, you know, had this idea and uh, um, put put fights together and, um, and said, so we're going to talk about the criteria, what's important. Love it. And how we can make things better. So guys at home are not getting stagnant, not just sitting around, not doing anything. To be honest with you, all of us watch fights still. I still do at home. I, I, like I said, I have a passion for it, just like you do. And like all of us officials do. But these judges that are there, the top level judges are constantly watching stuff. And we're constantly going over things. And believe it or not, even watching it from watching it on TV and seeing it live, you're like, it's a, it's a, we have time to talk about it, but when it, you're sitting in that hot seat as a judge and you have to make that decision, there's a lot of factors that go into it when they turn into scorecards. So much stuff. People don't know that the, ju- that the seats that the judges sit at, sometimes there's, there's the pillars are blocking their view. So they don't get a clear view and they have a small TV in front of them to look down on. So they're watching between that and the fight and trying to get it right from one view only. Well, we're watching it on TV. We got commentators. We got everything else giving their, their, their bits and pieces of it and eight different, 10 different camera angles on a fight. So we get the best out of it. They only get one view. And they, then on top of that, it's, there's an obstruction right in front of you on the side that you have to kind of go to the side and take and see what you're looking at. And, ah, geez, I hope I make the right call. Mm-hmm. And that's what you have today, you know, and obviously – they do the best job they can. These guys are really good at what they do. You know, a lot of them are. And, and there's some other ones that are still coming up that are making to learn. There's a learning curve for some other judges that are still up and coming, but your top tier guys, um, they, they do a very good job. I think they're, they're, you know, I don't think they get the credit that they deserve when it comes down to judging. So, and I'm not just saying that because they're my friends, but I'm saying that because I know how much they work hard at their craft and, and what they do to make themselves better. And we're not always going to get it right. You know, even as, even as a referee, we're going to make mistakes. And when you make a mistake in MMA, it sucks. <laughs> You're going to hear. Yeah, and we'll get to that in a second. But I'm just curious, one last thing on these calls. Is California, to the best of your knowledge, the only commission that is do- doing this right now? Or are you a part of other... You know, I know you're, you're licensed to work outside of California as well, um, but is ca- California to me is the gold standard, so I'm not surprised that Andy Foster is doing this, but do you know of other states that are doing this as well? Yeah, yes. Um, this is something that's Andy set up, but all, all lot, a lot of other states aren't in on it. The bigger states aren't in it. Um, you know, New York's, uh, you know, they're on board. You know, okay. they got an amazing commission. You know, they're, they're awesome. You know, uh, Kim Sumler is, is she does a great job in New York. She rocks it. Um, you know, you got to, Texas is in on it as well. Um, obviously, California, Nevada is there. Okay, um, that's great. So it's not just one commission. Everyone, I, I love to hear that because, uh, as you, as you just said, you know, you could be stagnant. You need to keep sharpening those tools. And I think that one of the things that people have criticized, you know, officiating over the last, honestly, the last couple of months. Before 
before this this all came to a halt, there have been some controversial moments. So it's great to see that people are taking the initiative. Now, I'm, I'm just curious, um, going back to the beginning, how do you go from meeting John McCarthy to then becoming a licensed official? Like, what were the steps that you needed to take in order to become a recognized licensed official? You know, it's, that's a that's a very good question, and I actually have a story for that. That's Big John took me under his wing, and back then um, there wasn't many officials in California. Um, it was obviously Herb. What year is Big, this? This is oh seven when I got licensed. Okay, so okay. I, you know, I began. I would. I started doing a lot of, I refereed a lot of smokers and that's how I started. It was a gym that I was training at. I always had fights. They needed a referee. I did. I would do about 25 or 30 fights by myself just to get the reps in. And the first fight that I ever officiated was in TJ in Tijuana, Mexico. Um, obviously I speak fluent Spanish. I'm Mexican. So I speak it, read it, and write it. And I understand TJ. I understand. I grew up going there as a kid. While I did a, a fight in Tijuana, that was the first professional fight I ever had. I was told to get experience by Big John, try to get as much experience as I can. So I did anything I could. I would do it for free. Anywhere there was a fight, I would go for free. It didn't, it didn't bother me how much it cost. I needed to get that experience. So with that being said, I'm doing this fight in teacher. I remember there was a cut in my fighter, completely on top of his head. He was bleeding. It was a disaster. And I was a referee. And the moral of the story is I went to the, I call time, blood's in this fighter's eyes, everything else. And I asked the fight doctor, you know, Dr. Time, can you come here and check this out? And, you know, the doctor's not paying attention to me. He's, he's drunk. He's got his oh. beers on uh, uh, at the, at uh, the apron of the, uh, of the, uh, around the cage. Um, and, uh, he's trying to pick up on ring girls. Right. So this drunk, this drunk doctor's completely blitzed out. He's hammered. And I'm calling him, and he's over here calling Ringo. Come here, come here. And then he, and he looks at me and he goes, It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I'm like, Dude, this dude's not okay. You know? <laughs> that was my first fight. And wow. I let it go. The doctors, you know, he told me to let it go. Fortunately, that guy ended up knocking the other guy out. He won. Wow. It, yeah, it worked out well in that situation, right? And so the moral of the story is, hell, if you can referee in, in, in Tijuana, Mexico, you can referee anywhere and make it. So that's, that's, that's how it all started. And I got my experience anywhere I could. And then I eventually subsequently got um, licensed in Tijuana. And, I mean, I'm sorry, in, in California. And, uh, and the journey began. And a lot Did of you have to pass the test or something? I think, you know what, if I recall, I think we, we did have to take tests. Yes. Okay. And do you we have to take a take... test for referee and judge, or is it just one test? I think if you want to judge and referee, you had to do both. Okay. Take a referee and a judge and test. I think that's what it was. I'm not sure. Don't quote me on that, but I'm, I'm, I, think, I think I did take a test. I'm almost positive I did because I've taken several exams. Um, and uh, here we are today, you know, and the journey began in California. And because California has the most shows in the country, we get a lot of repetitions. And not only that, but we also have camo. So it doesn't matter if we have a very large scale show like a UFC or Bellator or PFL that comes into our town or, or to our state. I also officiate amateur fights. And it doesn't matter. I just want to get in there and get, this, get the repetitions I can because that, that makes me a better official. I, I'm getting a lot of reps in. So we're pretty active here. We can work every weekend here in California. Do you remember your first UFC event? Which one it was? What year it was? I think I judged it. And it might have been, I don't recall. I think it might have been Ronda Rousey and Carmouche. Oh, I think and was, Anaheim. That, and Anaheim. That might have been my first one. You were a judge and for that fight or that event? I judged that event. Okay. Um, wow! I judged, that, I judged that event. And when you were there, sitting there, now you're at the UFC, historic event as well. First female fight, main event, all that stuff. Ronda Rousey. What is that like for you? You're sitting there, like, holy smokes, here I am. You know what? It was, it, it was, it was epic. You know, it was, it was, it was the start of something amazing for me. Um, and 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 just being there and and being a part of that, you know, seeing that fight and so many fights thereafter. Uh, whether I was judging or refereeing, um, 
you know, it's been an amazing journey. You know, it's, it's been, it's been, it's been awesome, but, uh, I don't remember exactly which my first UFC it might've been. And I don't remember to be honest with you, or I think the Diaz Josh Thompson fight might've been probably one of my, my biggest come out fights. Yep. Um, so you know what's I, amazing I, about I, that? The anniversary of that was yesterday, seven yeah. years yesterday. You were the referee, very famous fight for a couple reasons. Number one, uh, the only TKO loss and I, via stoppage, like Masvidal beat him via doctor stoppage, but the only time via strikes, I should say, that Nate Diaz has lost. But also Nick, his brother, in his corner throwing the towel um, in the middle of that fight, which is something that you don't see often. You were the referee for that fight, which is wild. But to be clear, you didn't stop it because of the towel, right? You stopped it because of the strikes? I stopped it because of the strikes, yes. Yeah, I didn't know they threw in the towel. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that. I had no idea what was going on. And, and, uh, and you know, let's just get something clear, you know. And Nate Diaz is just – he wouldn't stop. He would not have quit. That dude won't, will not quit. He's just – some people, they know when to say when. Not the Diaz brothers. Those dudes will go to the death. They're just, they're just wired that way, which is scary because that's just how they fight, you know. And there's, there's a few fighters that are like that, and you have to know the difference. Sometimes they're too tough for their own good. And Nate is just that crazy. He's insane, and he's just a bad dude. He will not quit. I stopped it because he had enough, and that's what I saw. Um, and it's on me. But that dude wouldn't have stopped. And neither, would have, neither Josh Thompson wouldn't have stopped either. So mm -hmm. it could have got even uglier. So um, that was an amazing fight for me, and that was probably the – in the beginning, that was the first big fight of my refereeing career that I was like, wow, I look back and I'm, I'm glad I did that fight. That was, that was pretty cool. Were you nervous? <laughs> Hell yeah. Dude, was I nervous? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. I was nervous, man. Dude, I was, how could you not be? You know, it was, yeah. Yeah, I was nervous, man. You have no idea how nervous. I get nervous all the time. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've learned to control my nerves a lot better, but it's funny because we all have little rituals, every little things that we do. And, and, uh, I remember for that fight, big John being big John, Herb was there and, uh, they knew I was nervous. And I was like, you know, I don't like to be around people. I don't like to talk to people before I referee. I just don't talk to me get away. I'm, I'm, I have a job. To, I don't, I don't just leave me alone. Um, and I was fidgeting around. I was kind of trying to figure out how, how I can channel my, my nerves. <laughs> when I'm in the cage, big John comes up to me and, and, and Herb was right there. He's like, Hey, Mike, come here. Yeah. Hey, what's up, John? He goes, he goes, Hey, come here, dude. Like get closer. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> I looked, dude, my heart sank and I was like in the, you know, the gate closes and that's big John McCarthy for you. You, know, you got Herb and, and all the guys are just laughing and, you know, hey, be careful what you wish for. You, you might just get it. And, uh, you know, it's been that kind of a journey with, with, with all those cast of characters that we work with, you know. But uh, um, definitely that was something that stands out for me. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a big part of, uh, you know, it's a big part of, of, of the fights I've done. And that one will always stand out as one of the top fights I've ever refereed. So... As we've been talking about, you know, you're known primarily for being a referee, but you judge as well. I'm wondering two things. Which do you enjoy more, judging or refereeing? And which one is tougher, judging or refereeing? That's a good question, dude. I like refereeing 100% better. I'm a referee. Um, they both have their challenges. Or they both do. They're both stressful. Um, I prefer to referee hundred percent more. Um, it's just something I enjoy doing. I do like judging, but it requires a different kind of focus. You know, just two totally different foot. When you're judge, when you're refereeing, you are, you, you could be out of position. And if you're out of position, bad stuff can happen. There's so much stuff that you're responsible for. And most importantly, you're responsible for lives and the safety of the fighter as a judge, you're not. As a judge, you're judging a fight. Now, obviously, your decision can impact someone's livelihood as well, but not their health and safety. There's a difference. As a, as a judge, 
you got a different kind of stress. You have to, you have to be accountable. Just say so you do as a referee, but you're also held accountable to a high level for the, what, what your decision is. And you better be able to articulate why you made that decision. And you know what? You should. You should be able to be able to articulate what you did, and you should be accountable. We all are. Accountability is everything, and let's not lose sight of that. We're put in there for a reason. You know what? You better do that damn job, and you better prepare yourself. So I get it. But we're also human too, man. You know, we do make mistakes. Um, and it sucks when I see my peers make a bad call, and I know how much love and passion they have for the sport, and they get ripped, ripped on like it's, 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 it's brutal. It's happened to me. It's happened to, you know, Herb and John and all of us have gone through these ups and downs. And you feel like the most, you feel like the loneliest person in the room, man. And guess what? You got to get on that bus back to the hotel with those guys after you made a bad call. Man, dude, it's, it sucks. So, you know, there's, hey, but at the same time, you know, it's what I love to do. And, you know, that's what comes with the territory. You know, but uh, you, you also you got to have a little compassion as well. Yeah, I, I've long said that I think MMA referees have the toughest job in sports because it's so subjective when you stop a fight. Even in boxing, it's a lot easier, in my opinion, as difficult as it is, because it's not as clear cut. And plus, uh, you know, we're still evolving as a sport. Judging is tough. We've seen that as well. So I really feel for you guys. Those moments where, you know, something controversial is 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 decided upon, and then social media can get really ugly. Does that happen to you? And do you just block it out or do you read that stuff? How does it affect you? Because I can't imagine it being very fun. Um, you know, I do have a social media and if people, you know, obviously, it, you know, my page is open. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, of course it's hard not to read what people say when they direct them towards you or they tag you on something and that sucks. Um, and, you know, people have the right to do that. I'm cool. You can't be thin skin either. You can't get all butthurt, dude. You know, <laughs> dude, you're the one that messed up. I get it, man. It sucks. But sometimes and, you didn't mess up and you'll still get hate, right? You'll still get people who bet on the other guy and think that you screwed up and things like that, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it blows. It doesn't matter. It's going to suck. But you have to just, you know, that's why there's such a small core of us that we're really tight and we talk with each other all the time. And, and these are the ones that I, I can find and they know, they know my mechanics They know, and I talk, I talk to John all the time. Um, and it doesn't matter what, it, you know, the person that this watching the fights is drunk and he has his opinion and he puts his tweet out or his, his, his message out. I listen to the ones that I know love me, care for me and want what's best for me. And there ain't that many, man. It's just a small crew of people, very small. And I do talk to John, Mike Bell, and Ron McCarthy. I talk to Andy. But Big John's the one that breaks things down. He's brutally honest. He won't sugarcoat it. Mike, this is what you could have done. And he knows how to talk to me. And he'll break it down. And I'll listen. I have a choice. Either listen to what he has to say or dismiss it and think I'm above that. We can't grow as officials. You know, I do talk to Mark Goddard. Um, you know, talk to Herb, Jason Herzog. All of us communicate with each other. Frank Trigg. Frank Trigg is actually, he's, he's, he's a really smart dude. He gets it. And uh, I admire him for what he's doing as well. From being a fighter, Hall of Famer, to a fish. You know how tough that is? Mm. You know? And these are people that I can find and talk to. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, when you mess up, you know, you're, it's, it does suck. When you're in the doghouse, for sure. I'm, I'm curious uh, what you think about open scoring. That was a hot topic recently. Are you in favor of open scoring or not? I haven't really looked into the open scoring um, scenario. Um, you know, I really don't have an opinion on that. One thing I would like to see is me personally, and of course I may not fly, and I have done it before, is the half point system. You hmm. know, as a judge, I do like that because I've actually done it here in California. I personally liked it. I think it 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 gives you a depiction and a number how actually really close that round was. Was it a 9.5 or a 9? Was it an 8.5 or an 8? It gives the person that, that, that has half a brain cell and really wants to know about the sport and really get it, 
and wants to know exactly what's going on out there with the judge's mind by the half point system. I like it, but I'm not sure it's, it'll get adopted or anything else, but we did it in California, the amateur system, and, and it was successful. You know, it was, it was, it was actually pretty interesting. You do get a lot of draws though. Right. Yeah. yeah. What about the fact that, okay, so, so you say half point, but what about the fact that when, you know, you're going to some states, you're working in some states, they have the old rules and then the new rules and things like that. I know the fighters get confused. For you, do you ever find yourself getting confused? You can, and it, you can, but that's your job. So I do ask. I'm very huge on the rules. You have to know the rules of the state. Not everybody's with the unified rules, just like you said. So some rules have, well, you got two two hands down, you know, this and that. Now it changed, right? So now they're in compliance with, with the unified rules for the most part, all, all, all of them with the exception of maybe some states. And those states I don't think I work for. But for the most part, before that, yeah, you know, you do have to know the rules of what each state is, what is allowed and what's not allowed. So I go to the commission and I ask them, what is the rules? Well, how are you guys going to, you know, call these fights? What rules are you actually going with? And I need to know so I can tell the fighters. So fighters aren't confused, you know, and I don't, and when I conduct the rules meeting, that is the most important part of the fight is the rules meeting. hundred percent. They know fighters know the rules. Fighters are very smart. Fighters will are highly intelligent athletes. They're smart. And some of them are actually like, they just know how to manipulate the rules. And that's your part as a referee. Tell them, nah, dude, this is how I'm going to call it. Young lady, this is how I'm going to call it. Are we good here? Are we straight? Do we get each other? Yeah. No, no. Do you understand? So we're straight and we don't have any issues. We understand what's going on here. This is how I'm going to call it when I get out there. You know my personality and I know yours. And we're both on the same page, including your camp. Do we all collectively understand each other? That's how it's done. So we're mm. on the same page. You know, um, speaking of that, I, I believe you were a judge for the very famous Michael Chandler versus Eddie Alvarez fight, the first one. Yes. Um, our, in my opinion, the best Bellator fight of all time on maybe the greatest night in MMA history because across the country, Shogun and Hendo were fighting at UFC. That, a fight like that, you're judging a fight like that, and it's so, it's so close. In the end, it doesn't need, you know, it doesn't need to go, uh, it didn't go the distance. It, was, it ended in a finish, but you have a situation where it's so close. Wait, did it go? Did it, I, I'm getting confused. It went the distance. It, it, it did go the distance. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. of the second one. Um, it's so close, but it's so exciting, and it's going back and forth. Like, what, do you remember what you're thinking in that fight? Because that's one of the all-time great fights you know, in the history of the sport. <laughs> Man, I was... I couldn't believe what I was watching. I was just like, wow. And I got to judge this. Yeah. I'm like, I got to make a decision. Oh, damn. Oh, wow. Dude, did, I'm just watching the fight as like, and try to be honest about it and, 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 and process as much as I possibly could and give the best I could to, to those fighters. And um, yeah, I had it for Michael Chandler. And, uh, um, boy, it, it was, look, man, I can't argue with the other side and they can't argue with me. It, it, and we've talked about this so many times and, and, and did you see this? And there was stuff that I didn't see on the other side that the other two judges saw and they didn't see what I saw. So, you know, it was just one of those fights that, that, uh, it was amazing to be a part of. Um, and, you know, I stand by what I, what I put down on the scorecards. Um, but I'm not going to argue with the other judges as well and try to sway them my way because they had actually very good valid points. So just one of those, one of those things. That's why you have three judges. Is there one call over the years that still eats at you that you wish you could take back? <sighs> you know, you know, there was one fight on a smaller show and some of the best fights you see are on smaller shows, not the big ones. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you see some amazing fights on the smaller shows. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually did. I actually did did have it reversed, and I made a mistake on it. Um, there was one fight. Uh, where the guy threw an uppercut right as the bell rang, and I thought it was right at the time, but it was actually after the bell, and he knocked the other guy out, and came back, and and I stopped the fight. It was actually I shouldn't have done that. You know, it was, it was one of those scenarios. 
Um, the fighters, the fighter complained about it, saying it was after the bell and it shouldn't have been, should be overturned. And I looked at, I saw the fight and I, once again, I talked to John about it. It was, I think you messed up. Yes, I did. And, you know, I wrote a rebuttal stating that I made a mistake and I owned it and the fight was overturned. Wow. Um, so, you, you know, you have to, that's one way to get credibility with fighters. And, and we don't know everything. At least I own it if I make a mistake and it sucks because I impact people's livelihood if I make a mistake or their health and safety. So I do care. I do care a lot about the fighters. And, um, you know, just, I have a son who, who also trains and maybe one day will be fighting. You know, I would hope that if my son does go down that road, which I hope he doesn't, but if he does, um, you know, the referee will give him the same, will treat him like if it was his own kid. And that's kind of, as funny as I get older now is, um, I look at those as, hey, I'm officiating my kid, and those kids have parents, and they have family and loved ones, and, and I'm here to protect them as well. But this is a, this is their profession they chose, and it's inherently dangerous. But I want to make the right call, and and if you don't care and if you don't have compassion in this sport, or you make it about yourself, you're going to have issues. You're, you're not real. You're a fraud. Now I got to ask you, UFC 241, August of last year in uh, Anaheim. You were part of some major news because all of a sudden the show is rolling. You're uh, refereeing a fight. I think it was an Ian Heinish fight. And it appears on camera that you have shaved the mustache because it didn't, <laughs> it didn't look like it was dangling there. We weren't quite sure. Come to find out you had it tucked in. What was your reaction when you saw the reaction to you tucking in the mustache? And could you explain why you did this? You know what? I, I did afterwards and, and, you know, and I was told and um, – after so my phone was blowing up, I had a bunch of messages <laughs> and, and it was going off, dude, did you shave or what happened? Um, you know what? Honestly, it's, it's, uh, you know, different commissions or different, uh, organizations will have you do different things and they may ask you to do, Hey, we're, we're, you know, optics that you, so, so you can see camera lenses, you know, with your, with your, with your glasses, uh, body cams or, or whatever. Um, you know what, if an organization asks me to do so, I'm going to do it. It doesn't bother me. So if it doesn't bother me, it shouldn't bother anybody else. So, um, and at the end of the day, it's, 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 it's not about the referee. It's about the two fighters. Um, and that's the most important part. So if somebody asked me to tuck it in, I'm going to tuck it in. They asked me to tie it behind my back and, my, and, 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 and then a bow tie behind the back of my head. Yeah, that's cool. I'll do it. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't change who I am as a man. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to comply with whatever they ask me to do if it's in within reason. Right. I, I read that you have like a fight day routine with the mustache. Um, uh, you what? A routine. Do you have like a routine to get ready? Is that, is that accurate? Like how long does it take for you to get the whole thing ready with the elastics and how many elastics do you put in there? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's some fake news right there there's some partial truths to that okay <laughs> there's some there's some partial truths to that but do i have a, a fight routine yes i do but it has nothing to do with my mustache <laughs> the, it has nothing to do with that at all <laughs> that's actually funny Ariel. <laughs> no i do my mustache like is like i do every day um, okay. I'll, I'll take it out. I'll blow dry it. I'll keep it clean, and 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 I'll comb it out. Then I'll do the do the do the braids. How um, many how many elastics you got there? You know what, dude? I don't even know. I don't even count them. Oh, that's just on. like that's just like I don't. Like, you can do it right. <laughs> you can do it right now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine. Nine on each side. Nine on each side. Wow, eighteen yeah. elastics. And do you use the same ones every day, or do you use new ones every day? No, I use the same ones until I start. Okay. They start getting, you know, you know, worn down. Then I'll, I'll swap them out. Do you sleep with them braided in or braided, or do you, do you let them flow at night? No, I sleep with them braided, but I do let the I do let the stash flow. I do let it free once in a while. You know? I love it. And when you eat, what do you do? <laughs> do you tuck it in, or do you just let it hang? No, I just just keep it in, keep it like this. And and when it's and when it's free flowing and it's and it's and it's released uh, from its habitat, I just I just I just eat normally or. Or um, you know, just kind of make sure it doesn't get in my face, you know, my beard. Do you think you'll ever cut it off? No, never, never. no, hell no, not cutting it. Wow, not have you been offered something to like? Uh, have people tried to get you to cut it? I haven't been offered anything. I, no one's ever, you know, like as far as hey, we'll give you a million dollars to cut it. You know, even for that, I wouldn't do it. And now it's helped, right? Because you've 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 dabbled in acting, right? 
Yeah, yeah, I've dabbled into some kind of acting. Yeah. You were in the 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 spinoff for Sands of Anarchy, correct? A Geico yeah, commercial. Correct. Yeah, I did a I did some commercials. I did a Geico commercial. Um, I was arm wrestling with a with a, with a with some gal, and and she kicked my butt, and that was uh that was a basketball commercial. Um, that was a fun commercial. Um, and of course, I just recently did the the season finale of Deputy. I was a bad guy, and I get a shootout with the cops. And the most, like, uh, the biggest ones I've had so far is definitely Mayans. Um, nice. I'm, on, I'm on that show, and uh, I'm with some great actors, Emilio Rivera, you know, J.D. Prada, and great guys that, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to be on that show, and we're just waiting for to shoot. And um, I should be on a few more episodes, hopefully, and we just got to wait for this pandemic to pass, you know, and, and get back to work. What a life. Uh, let, let's end on this because, you know, um, officiating is uh, is very polarizing, right? It, it could be controversial. You know, you have that John Jones, Dominic Reyes fight. Everyone gets mad and we want to blow up the whole thing. What do you say to the people out there, the critics who say MMA officiating isn't good? It's 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 not where it should be. You know, you're someone who has <clears throat> devoted your life to this. You're part of these calls. And I'm sure you take it personally when you hear these things to the people who don't believe that MMA officiating is where it's at. What do you say to those people? You know what? That's a very good question. I had, and I have an answer for that. Um, Big John McCarthy has a command course. Okay. Um, Jaron Bilal and, and, and Big John teach it. Jaron and uh, Big John do an amazing job. I help teach a class too. Uh, myself, Jason Herzog, Mike Bell, we're all a part of it. Frank Trigg, even Mark Goddard comes down and helps out. And it's in it's during fight week, so there's no reason why these critics, these so-called self-professed experts, just by watching fights, gives them the credibility to write and do what they want to do, because they're journalists. That's cool. God bless you, you know, and, and keep doing what you're doing. But be, but be honest with yourself. Before you can write down and criticize something, why don't you go to the source and take the class? And really understand what the criteria is. Really process what is being taught. And understand what goes through a judge when you're judging these fights. Take the class. Big John will offer it. He'll welcome you in there. Come in there and watch it. It will not only make you a better journalist. It'll make you, it'll give you an insight and an understanding of really what goes on in officiating, whether you're a judge or a referee. We even have inspectors in there that go in there. So... With that being said, there have been some journalists that have come in there and taken the course. And actually, a lot of, most of the people fail the class. It's that hard. The, 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 the passing rate isn't high at all. Probably less than 10% people fail. Most, less than 10% people fail the class. I mean, pass, you mean the, pa class. pass the class. Pass, yeah. pass, pass yeah. the class, yeah. Less than 10% pass the class. Mm -hmm. Correct. Wow. Yeah, it's that hard. So. You know, even if they don't take the test and want to just go in there just to, just to get an idea, I think it'll make the sport a hell of a lot better. And it'll give some, some real credence and a little respect, to the, especially to the judges and, and how badly they get beat up. And I mean, even, even the commentators, even the fighters, just because you're a fighter doesn't mean you completely know the rules either or know the criteria. You could have a, a, a you can be an amazing fighter and, 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 you know, be articulate and everything else, but not really know what the criteria is, what they're looking at, um, and, and what they're calling, how the referee does this and what they're doing with that. I think it, it's not good. It's not going to hurt. And it's going to make you much more well-rounded. You know, you can't go wrong with being educated. And I think that's, I think that's, that'll benefit everybody if they would do that. And I recommend they do. Well, this has been wonderful, Mike. I really appreciate this. You know, you're you're one of the uh, the people in the sport that I think makes it so special, and it's great to connect with you and learn more about your past and how you got into this. Uh, I feel like the officials are the unsung heroes of our sport because uh, you guys are put in a very tough spot. You have to make quick decisions on the fly. There's millions of people watching and uh, very quick to judge you, and uh, I just have a lot of respect for you guys. And, you know, I don't think that there are – a ton of great ones, but I think that's a product of the, the youth of our sport, and we have a long ways to go, but people like you and, of course, John McCarthy and uh, so many of those names that you mentioned are, are the ones who are uh, you know sticking your necks out and, and pioneers in many
many respects. So thank you for what you do. Thank you for keeping the fighters safe. And thank you for doing this today. It was great to, uh, to learn more about you. You got it, bro. You know, thank you for having me on. And, and uh, you know, you stay healthy out there, stay clean, and, and uh, be safe out there, bro. Thank you. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.